Hey everybody, it's Tommy Ashley, host of the Inside Carolina podcast. Ross Martin and Buck Sanders sat down virtually with Carolina's offensive and defensive coordinators last week, and we've taken the time to put together two shows that you'll surely love. First up, Jay Bateman. After Ross and Buck's interview, you'll get the full Inside Carolina roundtable and break it all down. Later in the week, we'll do it all over again with Ross and Buck's interview with OC Phil Longo. If you think you're excited about Carolina football, wait till you hear what Longo and Bateman have to say about their expectations and going into the spring. Now, first, Ross, Buck, and Jay Bateman. Welcome in to a very special edition of the Inside Carolina podcast. We are introducing uh, UNC defensive coordinator Jay Bateman and UNC offensive coordinator Phil Longo. We're going to go with Jay Bateman first. Uh, I'm your host, Ross Martin. As always, I'm joined by Buck Sanders, president of Inside Carolina. Before we get into it, we want to thank our sponsor, Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Remember, subscribers can get 10% off any purchase of Johnny T-Shirt. Um, on the Inside Carolina message boards. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the Inside Carolina podcast. Buck, you're up. Jay, one of the questions we we're getting a lot is that I'm looking over the roster and you've got 10 defensive linemen over 285 pounds. And you haven't had that in the past. So how might that open up your playbook or will it at all heading into 2021? Yeah, that's a good thing, Buck. I understand it's a good thing, but how, how will it change things for you? So, uh, I think especially last year, we got into a situation where we, um, we weren't as confident with some of the guys um, being able to play three big bodies at a, at a time. You know, like you look at Notre Dame, you know, we asked Tamon Fox to go in there and play what, you know, a, a position that he plays some in, 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 in some of our packages, you know, against, you know, Notre Dame with three tight ends on the field. And that's not really ideal, you know. And, and I, I really think in the bowl game you saw a little bit more of it, you know, where we were able to, to play with bigger bodies. But, um, you know, ideally, I mean, it's, it's a 3-4 defense, right? So ideally the, the three down guys were three D linemen in it, and it's three, you know, of the biggest humans we can find. So, um you know, I, I think when you look at guys like Kevin Hester and how he came along and Miles Murphy, how he came along, you know, we'd like for those guys to play more. And, and, and what it means is you're playing with one, you know, one outside backer instead of two outside backers. And I, I think you kind of see the, the, the depth chart morphing that direction. You know, you look at the you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're very fortunate right now because Taman and Tyrone came back. But, you know, ideally, the outside linebacker position is a is a little bit smaller position number wise than the D line position. And I think that's kind of the direction we're headed. So when you look at these defensive linemen this year, I mean, just going down the, the roster here, we have some guys we haven't seen as much, like Kedrick Bingley-Jones, who was injured last year. Um, Clyde Pinder played some. Miles Murphy, you mentioned. Kevin Hester. Of course, we know Raymond Vahasek and Tamari Fox. I mean, which player of those, or even some guys we haven't mentioned, do you expect to really take a big step um, where they maybe listeners don't know as much yet? I mean, the, the crazy part is every single kid you just mentioned has never had a spring practice. You know, so, so, so all those kids are going to have a spring practice. So I think the biggest jump a kid makes, especially a big person, right, is when they get to have a spring practice, right? Because now you, you stack, you know, you add 15 practices and the preparation that goes with it to, um, you know, to, the, to, their, to their early years, right? So you get, you know, so I, I you know, Kevin Hester, Miles Murphy, um, I'm really excited about those guys. Ray Hassick, I'm really excited about that. You know, those three have played a lot, but you know, Kendrick Bigley Jones was hurt, mm -hmm. you know, and I think now he, I wouldn't say he's a hundred percent, but he, he's pretty much doing everything right now. And he is going to be a really, really impressive football player for us. So, you know, I think all those guys were excited about, you know, and then obviously the two freshmen are here and they, you know, they have a lot of, they have a really, a, a lot of talent, a lot of skill. So, yeah. so have those guys go play with is going to be important too. And those are two highly recruited, highly ranked kids. I mean, do you expect them to, and with a spring practice and with a full strength conditioning, you expect them to at, at least get you some 10 to 20 snaps next season? I would be disappointed if one of them wasn't playing significantly. Okay. And we'll see which one of them it is based on how they perform. Let's get to the outside linebacker position. Uh, you, you mentioned already uh, Fox and um, Hopper coming back. Uh, it's big for you guys, but uh, 
Des Evans and Cayman Rucker, they played a little bit on the tail end of the season. You guys had a lot of sacks against A&M that hadn't given up a lot of sacks in the orange bowl. So, um, you know, how do you see that rotation going and, uh, who are you looking forward to seeing actually on the field, uh, in the spring? You know, you know, but the, the, the kid you did mention is probably the kid I'm the most excited about. That's Chris Collins, you know? So, you know, I, I, I think Chris Collins really came along for us last year. He had three sacks for us, played about, uh, probably about 250 snaps roughly, I think. You know, so that, that type of, um, you know, Chris Collins does a lot. We, you know, we, you, we talk a lot about like the, that position, you know, and Javon does a, DeWitt does a great job with them. That position does a lot. You know, you get, you've got to be able to go in there and be a, be a real D lineman and then go out inside and be a real linebacker. So, um, yeah, obviously, I mean, I, I think that the young man that's going to take the biggest jump out of that group is Desmond Evans, right? So, you know, again, here's a freshman who's going to have spring practice and it's going to be, you know, you know, um, you know, I thought Des Evans' best game that he played for us was the bowl game. You know, so yeah, you know, I, I just think it, you know every week that kid stacked better, you know, better, better in reps and played more and more and more. So, um, you know, I'm excited about Chris and Desmond. Obviously, Tamon and Tyrone. You know, Tamon Fox has played 2,500 career snaps for us here at the University of North Carolina. Like that's insane. <laughs> like, he's coming back. I mean, like I, I like today. I was like, what are you 27? How old are you exactly now? So. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, Tamon Fox is going to play, if he's healthy, well over 3,000 career reps. Like, think about that. Like, as a, as a defensive end outside backer, that's insane. So, um, I'm excited about all those guys. You know, Cayman Rucker is a little bit different. Right? He he does a lot of things. You know, he, he's kind of the the, 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 the specialist, right? And, and we're trying to find ways to play him more, you know. And, and I think you're going to see him do a lot more as he continues. He, he, he's not the same body type as the yeah. rest of them. So he's going to play down some as yeah. well as up. I think, he'll, I think he'll ideally, you know, you know, you watch the bowl game and you watch Kim and Rucker when he played like a defensive end position, right? He was one of our most effective players. So, you know, we've got to, you know, he, he gives us the ability to be an edge rusher and to be able to drop in coverage and be able to be more of a D lineman body type wise. I think Taman gives us some of that. So I, I think you'll see Kamen and Taman being a, in a, in a role, you know, similar. And I think you'll see Des and Chris in a role similar. And then I think you see Tyrone Hopper as a kid who does a lot of things. Is, is that room's really going to be a really, really good room. Is that the hardest position to recruit to on defense? Yeah. So it, there's a reason they get drafted the highest, right? Like edge rushers, right? Like if you don't have an edge, if you don't have guys that can, you know, when I first got here, right. You know, and Taman was, was, was becoming that. And I think he has become, you know, a really, really good edge rusher for us. But if you don't have that, if you, you know, I, I saw all the time, right? Like, it's like add water, shake, and you get pass rush. Like, if you don't have that pl- that player, right, then you have to create it all the time. And, and create it's fine, but it not, you know, it takes a lot more work. You know, you go get it is a lot easier. And, and so um, I think pass rushers in general, you know, every, I don't care what defense you play. You play, you know, you hear all, you know, frankly, we play all defenses. We play 4-3, we play 4-2-5, we play 3-4, we play 5-1. Yeah. We play all defenses, right? Like, and I think most people are like that. But the the one thing that everybody wants right are cover corners and edge rushers. Okay. So I think those two things are always the most difficult to not to find, but to find high level ones and then get them to come to your university. So, and I think we've made done a really good job of that since we got here. Quickly with Tamon Fox, what was that conversation like for him coming back? Was that a fact that you wanted him to come back and that he could really help y'all, and a fact of him? obviously wanting to improve his draft stock or what was that conversation like with you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I love Tamon Fox. I mean, he is everything you want in a football player. I mean, he is a football player, man. I mean, he prepares, he is tough. You know, like I go to Tamon before we play another game. I'm like, Hey, look, you got to go play four I against the, their left tackle. Who's six, six, three thirty. Okay, cool. You know, like he just does whatever you ask him to do. So of course I wanted him to come back. You know, I want a chance to come back, you know, I mean, yeah. but you also want to when a kid gets to a situation where they can go and improve themselves you know and go play the national football league that's the number one i mean that's the number two goal right the number one goal is to get a degree the number two goal is to go get paid to play football so i, I think when Tamon when we when we sat down with him and he we got some of the evaluations from the nfl i think there's some things that he can work on that he can work on with us and hopefully improve that um and, and i think you know you know we'll be able to move 
we'll be able to move him around more, I think, and, and, and put him in. I think like the end of the year, what you saw him do right, is be more effective when he is allowed to play more of a, an edge outside linebacker. And I think we'll be able to do that. And I think that will, will help him with the national. As a segue, you mentioned uh, Chas Ratt, uh, but Eugene Asante, you know, had a well of a bowl game, I thought. And uh, one of the announcers, to my chagrin, mentioned that you had a conversation with him about uh, how he's a different breed, a different type of inside linebacker these days. I'm chagrined because you didn't tell me or Ross or Greg, <laughs> but. Uh, so talk about that a little bit. What makes uh, Eugene Asante sort of the new breed of uh, inside linebacker? Like you, like in the Super Bowl, right? The two linebackers that played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are two tremendous football players. And I think one's probably about 220. The other one's probably about 235, you know, which is about the size of Chaz and Gimel and, you know, Asante. You know, they're all about 220 to 230 pound guys. So I, I think what you see at linebacker nowadays is because of what they're asked to do. Um, you need, I mean, you like Eugene Asante was recruited initially as a high school player as a tailback, right? When, when Eugene Asante was a sophomore or junior in high school, he was a tailback, and then as a senior, they moved him to linebacker. And after like five or six games, people were like, "Whoa!" Um, you know, so I I think what you what you see at our at our linebackers right now, and when you look at Jeremiah, you look at Kyrie Jackson, Cedric Gray, Eugene, uh, and then you know Power and and um and Ra Ra coming in, right, are guys that, that have running back kind of bodies types and skill sets, right? They're, they could go, you know, back in the old I formation days, they, they could have gone and, and, and been an I formation tailback. And, and I think that's what Eugene has, right? Eugene can run, he can cover. And, and you know, I think the days of the, you know, I, I tease Thig all the time, like the days of like, you know, I mean, Thig's, a, you know, Thig's like 250, you know what I mean? Like the days of like the big, like. Dick you know, Bucka. Yeah. Rick Steinbacher and, and Tommy Thigman, like those guys don't play anymore, bro. You know I mean? <laughs> so, like, I just think like the, the linebackers are different, and um, and so I think that's who Eugene is. That, that that's what Chaz is too, and I think that's why the NFL has a high opinion of Chaz. It's the ability to run and cover and blitz and all the things you have to do in space. So I, I think the skill sets become more of a safety skill set than a D lineman skill set, and I think that's what Eugene is. You mentioned Ra Ra, and I think listeners, subscribers are super excited about Ra Ra because of what he brings from an athleticism standpoint and speed, he hasn't played for you yet. You haven't seen him in spring practice, but what do you think you can, how can you use him over the course of his UNC career? And what does he bring that makes him so unique? You think? So we've been able to work with him now for a couple of couple weeks, you know, watching him with Hess and a month or so, you know, just mm-hmm. watching him with Brian. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited about Rara. And I, I do think, you know, I, I, um, I think you have to be a, um, you have to play a position. Does that make sense, right? Like, like the thought that like, oh, we're just going to put him out there and just he's this universal tool and he's going to go play. Like, I don't think, like you, the most valuable guys are the guys that play a position and then can also go play other things. And I think Rara will be like that. I, I think Rara will be able to go play, you know, safety and, and, and play at a, at a second and a third level because of his athletic ability. But he's going to be a linebacker and the, and the most important thing for our linebackers to do, right, is run and hit. And 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 he has a very, very high skill set for that. So, yeah, I think you're going to see us move him around kind of like we did with Conley a little bit early before he got hurt. Um, I think you'll see some of that kind of same stuff. Um, you know, we, we've already talked about, you know, we, we need to find a way to, you know, like I didn't do a very good job with Eugene because we, I was like, I'm not ta- – I can't take Chaz out. And we, we weren't um, veteran enough to handle a lot of different things – at some spots where now I feel like we are. So I think now we, we need to get Ra Ra and Gimel and, and Asante on the field together um, in, in, situ, in certain situations and create certain defenses. And I think that's, that you'll see some of that in the spring if you're out there. If, we, if Coach Brown lets you out there, Ross, which probably won't happen. But I'll God willing. You. Uh, you mentioned Conley. That was kind of my next question. I mean, he kind of, along with Ra Ra, seems like one of the more unique guys you have. He played Nickelback this last year. I know you want to play him at safety. You think that's his position. Is that going to happen? Is he going to move positions? How do you expect to use him? I know in your defense, you know, you could be multiple things um, at the same time. So, I mean, like, so we, the, we, we're a little bit different in that our nickel kind of trains at corner and at safety, you know, with, um, mm-hmm. you know, Dre has him some of the time. I have him some of the time. So like, like, I mean, there was at one point in the season last year, you know, which has been two years and hopefully I never go through it again. Like we were really banged up at corner. I think it was Duke week. Like, like, 
we were working JQ at corner. Like, hey, dude, you go out there and play man, and we'll figure out the rest of it. So, um, so I, you know, I think JQ, I, I think his value as a nickel is really, really high, right? Because he can play man coverage, and he is 215 pounds or whatever, and can blitz, and um, you know, so he's got linebacker ability, linebacker size, but can play man coverage. Those are hard guys to find. So, um, I think his value is at nickel. We, we absolutely will try to, you know, give him more safety reps. But we feel pretty good about the safeties too, and and you know, safety is the hardest position, right? That they have to tell everybody everything, mm-hmm. and so I, I really I feel really strongly about those four kids back there, and uh, I I think I think our defense is better when JQ is at nickel, but you're you're going to see all of them get reps at it and just kind of see how it shakes out. Speaking of the defensive backfield, um, I think all of us would agree that the sky's the limit for Tony Grimes. We saw enough of him to know that, but talk about how um, important it is to have corners that could cover man to man. And in today's college defense, that seems like nearly a mandatory ability. Yeah. I mean, like in the off season, we we spent a lot of time trying to talk to other NFL guys and other college guys and, you know, the question I always ask is like, how are you protecting your corners? And everyone's like, what do you mean? You know? So, um, yeah, I mean, you, so, so we're, when we first got here, right, we, we knew that wasn't a, a strong suit for the defense. And, we, and, you know, Dre's done a great job, obviously getting Kyler to transfer was huge. Um, but, you know, Storm Ducks really progressed. I know, you know, he missed most of the year last year, but I still have a very high opinion of Storm. I think, you know, I think Ladeson Hollins has played, you know, 600 some snaps for us the last two years and played really well at times. So I think the corner situation has really become a strength of our team. If um, you could keep them healthy. Okay. It, it, it's, it's like one of those deals. It's like, I mean, Buck, I promise you, if it was like, Hey, they're getting hurt in this drill or this coverage, I would take it out, brother. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, Storm Duck got hurt, like running up, just running on air, you know? And so, um, you know, it is what it is, but you yeah. know, I think Tony Grimes um, has a has a ridiculous amount of athletic ability. Um, but I, I think what separates him is his his competitiveness and his drive. And I think he is a really, really uh, football smart. Football makes sense to him. And um, I agree with you. I, I think he's got a really, really bright future. And uh, but I feel the same way about Storm and Kyler. So I think I think we're really and and, and Day Day, frankly. So I, I think that that unit has become a really, really strength of our football team. Great. And I think that's about all the time we have for you. I mean, we could talk to you, I feel like, forever, Jay. Um, but we really appreciate your time. What would you say? I feel the same way, Rob. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> we really appreciate your time. And I feel like, uh, you know, most people are pretty excited about what the defense can be this year. It seems like you're finally getting all the parts you need through a couple years of recruiting. So good luck in the season. We look forward to uh, covering the team this spring. I mean, I- when we got on the bus after Texas A&M, I, like, I was like, let's go practice right now. Yeah. You know, that's how excited we are about th- this group. I'm, I'm excited to get to work with them. All right. Thanks, thanks Jeff. Coach. And welcome back to the Inside Carolina podcast. Again, I'm Tommy Ashley. I'm your host. Like I said, leading in, promised the ultimate Inside Carolina roundtable. And with that, you know I got to have Jason Staples and Greg Barnes and, of course, El Presidente, Buck Sanders and – Buck, since you were in the room where it happened during the Jay Bateman interview, I wanted to come to you first as we start this roundtable. Bateman um, is a seems like an excitable guy anyway. Um, he seemed pretty giddy talking about what he's got coming back and coming into spring practice and then with what's on campus as early enrollees. Did you get the same sense? You know, he, he looked like he was going to jump out of his chair or out of his skin. Uh you know, uh, Greg, you know, uh, through your previous uh, press conferences with Jay and uh, uh, Staples, you've been around him a few times. Bateman is always a positive, upbeat, you know, uh, all my geese are swans kind of guy. The next but, negative uh, thing he says about a player will be the first, which is not a bad thing, but that's yeah. just Jay. But, but this was different. I mean – uh, he could hardly contain himself, you know, when he was talking about the defense. Um, and, uh, 
and it wasn't like, you know, in a press conference where somebody gets answers, ask a question about a specific player. And, you know, he says, well, you know, he's looking good, blah, 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 blah. blah. I have all the confidence in the world with him. I mean, he was almost, almost could not stay in his seat when he was talking about the defense. And, you know, I think that's probably for good reason. And there were a lot of uh, topics that he went into that are uh, be formed the meat of this uh, podcast, at least that, uh, you know, have a lot to do with, with that excitement, I believe. And, and he has reasons to feel giddy, I believe. Jason, I'll, I'll bring you in here. A couple questions to, to get this thing rolling. One, the importance of these guys actually getting a spring and especially the young guys coming in and also the importance of, and, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but y'all mentioned 10 guys on that defensive line, possible in that rotation, 285 or more. I mean, this, Carolina's going to have more available talent at defensive line than they've had overall in quite some time. And I think for me, that that's the key. That, they that's had the 11, key. they had 11 guys until they moved AJ Beatty to center that were 285 or better. So, so, so they've got some beef and some depth, at least potentially there to challenge these teams that are built on elite defensive lines, Jason, your thoughts there on the, on just the overall factor at that position. Yeah, I'd say it's been since probably what, 2010 that they've had the kind of defensive line talent that they're, that they're going to be able to put out there. It's younger right now than what they've had then. It's more like the 2008 type defensive line. I think that's actually kind of your comparison is 08, 09 area uh, of what they're going to be able to put on the field. But you're right. That's the, that's where quarterback and defensive line are the, are the places where you, you can't not be great. If you're going to, if you're going to legitimately contend for a power five conference and to try to be a playoff team. And we all know that they've got a pretty good check market quarterback. The big issue has been on the defensive line and being able to, to, stop the run with fewer players, with fewer bodies, and be able to get pressure on the quarterback without, without having to blitz. And this is something where it says a lot when you're able to move quality big bodies to the offensive line and not have to worry about that. So, and you could hear it in Bateman's voice and see it in his demeanor. By the way, I, I don't agree with you, Greg, that the, the next time he says something negative about a player it will be the first time because I can guarantee you in the film room with said players and on oh, the, sure. <laughs> sure. on the field, uh, there have been think some Greg negative things saying. that have flown in the past. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. But as far as anything publicly, publicly facing, he handles that exactly, exactly right. But you can still see the difference. And this is what you mentioned, Buck. You can see the difference when he really, really likes his situation. And you can see the excitement start to come out when he's talking about certain players and being able to add some of the young talent to that defensive line. I mean, I know for, I know for sure that he is super excited about getting Bingley Jones on the field. He, he thinks that guy's going to be really, you can see his demeanor change whenever that guy gets brought up and he goes out of his way to bring him up as a guy that really could be special. And the thing that he, I think emphasized is, and, I, and one of the things that I gleaned from the interview was how much he, he emphasized, number one, they want to have three big bodies on the field as often as possible as their defensive line. And he commented that, look, what, what we want is we want to have more of those 285-plus guys. We want to have more of the defensive line type guys than we've got outside linebacker types. But on the current roster, or on last year's roster, they had more outside linebacker types than they had interior guys. So that they had to play a guy like Tamon Fox on the interior at times. And that's not where he belongs. And that just, that makes you worse at two positions. Cause now you're taking your best edge guy and you're putting them on the inside. And now he's saying, look, we've got it so that we should be able to have the talent to play three quality bigs at the same time and rotate those guys. And now that allows you to have your best guy or your best two guys on the edge. And it allows you not to have to blitz. It gives you more flexibility in terms of what you do coverage wise and what defenses you play. Because when you've got those big guys, you don't have to commit as much to the run. You, you, you don't have to 
to worry about making sure that that gap is handled. There's a lot of those things that, that it makes it easier. And I know, uh, you know, Jimbo Fisher is a guy I've spent an, a, a lot of time around as well. And he used to have a saying about this, that, uh, that big guys do more by accident. And big guys, half the time, big guys do more by accident than the little guys do on purpose. And when you get those big guys that can really play, there, you know, another saying you hear among coaches a lot is, there's a reason there's weight classes in, in, in combat sports. And when you have those big guys that can move, yeah, they're young, but this is where, and, and Bateman mentioned too, that, the, that, that having a spring is most important for the big guys, for the guys in the trenches, to be able to do the preparation for that, to get through the reps and get through learning how to use their hands and all of that stuff on the inside. That's who it matters for the most. Now you get a chance with all that young talent to get a clear spring, to get through those practices and to improve and, and have a chance to really be contributors come, come spring or come fall, that is. Greg, talking about this position, it was always interesting on the message boards, inside Carolina message boards and folks that are listening that aren't premium. Of course, you got to get on that boat, uh, especially this season. Uh, you know, people were talking about, well, Connor's defense looked a lot better against Texas a and a lot better against Notre Dame at times, but it was those fourth quarters that those guys wore down, especially, I'll be honest, I didn't notice it as much against Notre Dame, even though it was there, than I did against Texas a and I mean, seeing it in person against Texas a and it was clear. They could not hold up any longer. That's what this whole spring's got to be about, right? That's what Jay Bateman – marked he, he mentioned on the bus leaving the orange bowl that's got to be they got to get this position better to be to stay on the field with those elite guys yeah and i think there's two parts of this uh one we've talked about this before but one of the reasons Roy williams has been so effective over the years is he plays a lot of guys and he plays a lot of talented guys and he doesn't care if the score is close with 10 minutes to play because the way that he he pushes tempo the way that he rotates bodies if, you're, if you don't have a big lead late, his guys are going to run past you because you're going to be gassed. You're not, your best is not going to be as good as his best late in games. And we saw that against Notre Dame. We saw that against Texas A&M. Um, and so that, that's kind of the issue. And Jason touched on it. But the biggest thing I took away from that interview, which was a great interview, a lot of good questions from Buck and Ross, is the fact that when Tamon Fox is having to play defensive end in a 3-4 defense, so it means he's a big defensive end against Notre Dame that plays multiple tight ends. Good luck. Like that's going to hold up for a little while, but you have no chance over the course of a entire game of that working out. Um, and Carolina, give him credit, played a great game. But as you said, Tommy, once it got to the fourth quarter, I mean, you just saw the thing, the whole momentum shift. So the ability to be able to, to play guys where you need them is, is, important and to have the bodies to do it now there's still a lot of youth on this defensive front so while we can talk about there being 10 guys over 285 that's a significant step in the right direction but you still have a lot of freshmen and sophomore um, and as he said you know, you're going to need some of those freshmen to really come on and play very well early uh, Clemson's had a lot of success with that over the years relying on true freshmen uh, North Carolina's going to hope that that holds true as well but what it also does is with, with Tamon Fox uh, if you can move him truly to a, a, a pass rushing specialist job, and he's probably the, the only true pass rushing specialist that they have, which is an issue that they're going to have to try to develop in spring. Now, now you're talking, now you've got a legitimate two deep or even three deep on the defensive line, not having to use Fox and Tyrone Hopper. But now you've actually got guys on the edge who can create some havoc and, and get some more sacks uh, as as Mac and Jay have both said, a lot of the sacks UNC got last year were because of scheme, not because of individual talent. You want to get back to the days of the Robert Quinns and the Julius Peppers, right? Where you say, hey, you see the quarterback? Go sack him. And that's all you have to say. Instead of scheming up all these things where you have corner blitzes and you, you overload gaps and all these kind of things, you just let the guys play. And so Jay is certainly getting to that point. Are they going to be there this year? We'll have to wait and see. Two years for sure. Uh, that's why this offseason, to your point, Tommy, is so important. Right now, while Brian Hess has them, spring ball, and then the summer. Because they have a lot of things to catch up on. 
to really be able to to be the defense uh, depth wise and experience wise once August rolls around that this team needs it to be uh, for the for the team to really challenge for the ACC championship. Yeah, and to Jason's point on our side chat that you guys don't get to see, Chris Collins got a shout out from Bateman during that interview as, as one of those guys. And you're right, they need to have those designated guys that they just put in and say, go get the quarterback. Buck, you wanted to come back in with a little more on the defensive line. Like I said, and I'll continue to believe, if they can get this unit, this group, up to uh, another level or two from last season, then Carolina could be really good. On some threads in the – uh, Tarpit premium message board. There's been a little bit of conversation back and forth about um, if you watch North Carolina football last year, 2019, 75% of the time, they only had two down linemen on the field. It looked much more like a, I don't even know what to call it. A, a two, four, five, <laughs> a two, four, five. I mean, <laughs> it was, it was crazy in a lot of senses in that, you, you only had two guys with their hands on the ground. And specifically when I asked Bateman about the, the depth of the defensive line and how that might change his approach to defensive formations and strategy, um, he immediately went to uh, the ability to have three guys with their hands on the ground. And, and I think that's something that we're going to see a higher percentage of. Um, going forward. I, I don't believe that it's always a bad idea just to have two guys in there with their hands on the ground. It depends on the down and distance and, and all of that sort of thing. But as, as more of a base defense sort of thing, I think we're going to see more guys, uh, with, uh, you know, more formations with three guys with their hands on the ground. Jason touched on it. Greg brought up a good point about, uh, stamina and duration, but, uh, you know, I do think is there's potential for Bateman to have three guys with their hands on the ground, be able to rotate those guys, uh, throughout the game and, and guys still be fresh in the fourth quarter. And, and that kind of segues probably into our next topic, which would be the linebackers, you know, with, with three guys with their hands on the ground there's even greater potential for the linebackers to have be protected to a certain extent um, at that second level of the defense. Buck, that's a great point. And, you know, I was sitting here thinking about where to go with this. I mean, Eugene Asante sort of made his statement again in the Orange Bowl that he's going to be able to play. But, Jason, let me come to you and ask you the effect of a guy like uh, on Chasseret in a game where you're playing two defensive linemen. I felt like this season, especially, Chaz saw more linemen getting to him than he ever saw in, in the first year, I guess, 19. Um, that's a function of that, isn't it? Of Carolina not having the beef up front on the defensive line. No question. It, it, I mean, especially with what Bateman likes to do with his defensive linemen, when he's got guys that can, and even when he didn't have guys that were 285 plus, when he was at when he was at Army, you could see what, what they did when in a in a defense that was further along in his scheme and, and personnel that he'd recruited and all that. He he did a lot of two gapping with those guys, which means that you have your defensive linemen essentially trying to play the 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 blocker head up. So he's gonna take on I mean, there there are different ways you do this. Actually, the 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 simple way of explaining it is that you're you know going through the nose of the guy and you have the, the gap on either side the the practical way that it's actually coached is you're still attacking one half of the guy as the stronger side that you're committed to but you're responsible for the gap on the other side of him as well and what you're trying to do is drive him into that gap so it's a little bit different in, instead of trying to get penetration and get through the gap like you are in a one gap situation a two gap you're trying to basically cause a pile, cause a clog and keep the, keep whatever offensive lineman is there from being able to get to the next level. And ideally, if you can do that with, let's say you've got three guys up front that are able to, to two gap all at once. And normally he's not going to two gap all three, but if you have three guys that can two gap all at once, you have six gaps covered and the backers are free They They can roam to wherever they want because nobody's getting to those backers. 
you're, they're requiring double teams since each of those guys is responsible for those two gaps to get him out of there. You're going to have to double team him. Now the backers downhill Chaz did not have that luxury this year and he was not kept clean. A lot of the, a lot of the time. Now there were times where he ran himself into some trouble, but as often as not more often than not, it was simply, they just did not have, as you put it, the beef to protect him and keep him clean so that he could run to the ball. And I think this year's backers are going to be at a considerable advantage compared to what he had to deal with last year, uh, given what they should have up front, helping keep them clean. And, and this the, Bateman's defense is designed for those linebackers to be stars in terms of being able to get tackles, be able to do a lot there. Those guys, things should get funneled to them. And, you know, but it requires those defensive linemen to really be good enough to, to make those guys stars. Yeah. And Tommy, to, to build on that, it doesn't take a lot of talent up front to make that big of a difference either. I mean, two years ago, North Carolina really just had Jason Strobridge and Aaron Crawford. Uh, And you had two linebackers who had never played before and they had pretty good years. And you fast forward a year, you lose Crawford and Strobridge while the that came along that's really about all you had. And so just by adding some, some talented bodies, uh, that's going to look a lot better for the linebackers, as Jason points out. Well, well, let's talk about the linebackers briefly, because I think we can all agree that the defensive backfield is pretty set um, for the most part. We could debate the fourth corner, um, perhaps, and maybe when one you're of debating the your fourth corner, it means you've got a, a quality. <laughs> yeah, <group. laughs> yeah. So um, no disrespect to those guys. We probably won't discuss them much on this podcast, but Let's talk about the linebackers. Um, and, Greg, I'll, I'll keep it with you. Jeremiah Gimmel's a given. Eugene Asante's a given. Who's the next guy? Uh, you know, and, and I almost hesitate to ask because like Bateman said in this and like he's shown the past two years, if he's got two he can rely on heavily, he doesn't take them off the field. Um, I guess that's a good thing. I'm not sure if I, I think that's a great thing because if an injury happens, but – who's the third guy or excuse me yeah who's the third guy is it Dilworth is it Kadre Jackson is it somebody we haven't talked about I mean where, who, who's coming up there well they they certainly like Kadre Jackson um so I think he's he's probably a front runner for that third spot although he's working behind Jeremiah Gimmel so uh Gimmel is good of a player as he is and I I think he is going to be the heart and soul of this defense uh, he's a great interview he's always been uh very confident and if you, you listen to him incorrectly, sometimes you might think he's cocky. I don't think he is. I think he's just very confident, very sharp kid. That's, that's a benefit, and that's something that you need, obviously. Um, they also have a, a high opinion of, of Cedric Gray. So he's another one to watch out. And then, of course, you have the, the freshman, uh, you know, rah-rah and, and power that people are going to be looking for. So I think you have a good mix. I mean, there's a lot of times last year where Thickpen only had, I think, four linebackers back there. And that's one of the reasons they relied on Chaz and Jeremiah so much. Um, so I think that's important. Jay's comments on kind of the versatility of that position these days, I thought was very telling um, in that, you know, for so long, uh, even in the three, four, you know, you've got the, the inside linebackers were really kind of meaty guys, bigger 250, needed to know how to play defensive line much more than they did safety. And now because of the way, you know, the spread offenses have kind of taken over the, the game, now you've got uh, those inside linebackers really need to be pretty good uh, athletically to cover in space. Um, and so there's a lot of good pieces here. Um, they're going to rely on Asante and Gimmel for a lot of snaps. Um, and I think what they learned from last year is that if you've got talent behind them, even though they're raw, you need to give them some snaps so they can come along and, and be able to provide talent and, um, and snaps but also like we saw last year, you know, when Conley and Grimes started to see more snaps, all of a sudden that talent flourished and you can actually rely on them more. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And that, that will be the challenge is figuring out how to work these guys in while making sure you have good leadership on the, on the field. And just to follow quickly on, on Greg here, when you do get a little bit smaller and more athletic at those inside backer positions, that, puts that much more of a premium on having quality size on the defensive line. Because the thing is the reason in the old school 
three fours or five twos that you wanted those guys to be bigger, thicker guys. And as you said, to be able to kind of almost be interior linemen in, in some respect is because those guys are going to be taken on guards and centers the whole time. You know, when teams are running downhill at you, well, teams are still running downhill. They're running downhill out of the spread and they're throwing it, you know, throwing RPOs off of it now, but they're still running downhill, which means you'd better be able to have guys to keep those smaller linebackers clean or those, those guards haven't gotten smaller. <laughs> and so now you're just going to have a 220 pound guy taking on a 310 pound guy. And that's just not a fair fight. If, if you're getting a guy with a free release to the, to the backer. Now, if that, if you're able to keep that 310 pound guy occupied a little bit, that backer can get to that hole quicker. So it all starts. That's why it's so important to have those big guys up front to make those backers better. And then that allows your backers to be better in coverage. So the whole thing works together. And that's why getting your personnel set the way that they're doing uh, is, is really imperative. Go ahead, Greg, before I go to Buck to wrap this one. Let's, you got something else for me? Yeah, just, just one quick thing here. Uh, if you listen to the interview, which hopefully you've listened to it a couple times before you got to the roundtable, Jay made a good point. We've talked a lot about posi positionless uh, defense. He made it very clear, an important distinction, that he doesn't actually operate in that manner. And he believes that every single player should have a position. I think that's important. And what he was, what he meant was a guy needs to know what his job is and kind of where he can thrive. And what you want is you want a player who is versatile enough, like a Conley, like a Fox, who can not only do his job, but if you need to mix things up and get creative, you can move to Mon Fox, the defensive end. You can drop him into coverage. You can move Conley to linebacker in a certain position if you need to, or a certain scheme, or drop him back to safety instead of just being at nickel. Uh, I think I think as much as we talk about the whole concept of positionless defense on the message boards, that was an important distinction to me. I found it interesting where he said he told Conley, go play corner, just cover the guy. We'll figure out the rest against, I guess, Duke it was this yeah. past year. Buck, I'll let you wrap the show. I started talking about Bateman Giddy um, with what he's got. We'll talk about the offense in another round table that our listeners will hear in a couple of days, but – you know, I think this is the unit. I mean, I think the defense is where Carolina goes from being a, a preseason top 10 team to a postseason top 10 team. It, am, I, am I on to something there, or will the offense handle their business and it doesn't matter what the defense does? I think we're a long way from, from there to make that kind of call, Tommy. We, we got to see how things uh, shake out during the spring. We got to see how things shake out in August camp. We got to see if anybody gets bit by the injury bug. There's a lot uh, between uh, that, that needs to be talked about between now and when they uh, knock on wood. You did that, didn't you, Jason? Yeah. Uh, but uh, before we close out the show, I think we should not let it go uh, unnoticed or unsaid that they got three guys in the at corner that can cover man to man. And that is going to make a big difference in terms of what happens in front of them, uh, in terms of, you know, what the outside linebackers do, what the inside linebackers do, the ability to cover man on man tight, uh, is going to make a big difference And storm duck and Tony Grimes and Kyler McMichael, all those guys keep them healthy, please this year. Uh, but it, those three guys and Jason's knocking on wood again. Um, but I I've talked to a lot of defensive coordinators over the year, probably about over the years, probably 10 of them at North Carolina. And the one thing they'll all tell you is that if you've got a couple of guys that can cover man on man, it changes everything. And so, uh, I, I didn't want to let that go unsaid, uh, before we wrap the show. 100% there and a great point. And, and like I said, I look forward to sitting around the table when we're all vaccinated and everybody's clear debating who the fourth corner is because you're right, Grimes and McMichael and Storm Duck should be those three. I did like Bateman's comment where he talked about um, dealing with the pro guys, said, how do you protect your corners? And they're like, what are you talking about? 
Yeah. 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 And, and so, now the fourth corner has become Tommy's second favorite player <laughs> on the team uh, beside the reserve quarterback. Got to get somebody whose name, first name I can spell um, easily because my spell check is not working very well. Anyway, guys, it's been fun. This has been the Jay Bateman and the Roundtable podcast, of course, Inside Carolina. Many thanks to Ross Martin and Mr. Sanders for conducting the Bateman interview. Very good one. Go back and listen to it again. Bateman leaves plenty of nuggets out there if you didn't catch them the first time. And, of course, we appreciate everybody listening to this. Rate us, review us, subscribe, support Johnny T-Shirt and johnnytshirt.com. Stay tuned. Part two, the Longo and the Roundtable podcast coming your way in a couple days. Thanks, everyone.